Thank you, Sonia, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm, of course, very fortunate because all that needs to be said has been said, except for the point about nuclear, actually. So um, I'll try and be relatively brief and perhaps maybe reflect more on a few of the comments that have already been made than anything else. Um, let me just begin, though, by, by emphasizing, really, this is a unique period for electricity. I would contend, perhaps, the second real true revolution, uh, one as profound as that between Tesla and Edison. And that's really because the manner in which electricity services are going to be delivered into the future uh, is changing. It's becoming much more decentralized. It's certainly going to be enabled by uh, digitalization at a much greater extent. And this is leading to a whole host of issues up and down the value chain um, uh, that we've just heard about. Um, one point that hasn't been brought up, though, that I think is very important to emphasize, though, is that in this transition that we're now entering into, one thing that is unusual is that customers of all types are becoming much more engaged in defining their energy services. So this is the trend towards decentralization. This is the trend towards smarter consuming entities, be it buildings, be it individuals. And of course, the potential for the convergence of transportation and electricity at very large scale. And so we're going to, over the next decade or more, um, witness something that, uh, that, as I said, literally hasn't happened for a century. Now, we've heard a lot about the rise of renewables, and that's very true indeed. Renewables really are now at energy's big table. Um, one point that I think is particularly important to appreciate that is related to renewables rise is that in the case of solar photovoltaics in particular, um, its growth, and that's just shown here in the United States on the left-hand side in terms of annual capacity additions, its growth is taking place at different levels up and down the system. So it's not just on individual rooftops, and it's not just at large-scale utility centralized facilities, but it's across that entire spectrum. And that is really adding a lot of flexibility if we are able to embrace and manage that flexibility through programs like nodes um, into the, how we will run the system into the future. And if we look a little bit forward, there's no doubt that it is both wind and solar that is going to be the dominant source of new generation, not just here in the United States, but globally over the coming decades. And that's because the economics of these technologies have really gone through a profound reduction over the past, uh, over the past decade. That continues to happen. And what we also see as in, is a kind of a more advanced and more nuanced approach to how we begin to integrate things like wind and solar into the system now. We're looking at lower specific power wind machines. We're looking at changes in inverter loading ratios and solar facilities. And this is really adding to the quality that these resources can add to the system. Now, at the same time, um, there is another profound impact taking place that, uh, that we've heard about, and that is the rise of unconventional gas in particular. Um, I'm just going to pause on this particular slide. It's a favorite one of mine. Uh, this is just uh, wedges showing the growth in natural gas production from major shales uh, over the past decade or more. Uh, the point I like to make is that if you focus on the big wedge in the middle, that is the state of Pennsylvania, the Marcellus Shale primarily. If Pennsylvania was a country today, it would be the world's third largest producer of natural gas. Only the United States itself and Russia produce more natural gas than the state of Pennsylvania. And this has really led to this, uh, this shift entirely in terms of our impression about the scale and the availability and the cost of, of gas. And this is driving the secular reduction in the generation from coal and the growth in gas. And I will add, in a future that is increasingly dominated by intermittent renewables like we've heard, gas is the fossil uh, fuel of choice because of the flexibility that it can provide. Now, with all that said, we are now transitioning from a period where renewables have been a marginal resource to one where they really are becoming a meaningful resource at scale on the system. And this has some real implications. So if we look at the state of California, for example, as uh, solar's generation has grown, that's just that little bump down at the bottom, um, there uh, on the left-hand slide, that's solar's relative contribution to CAISO's generation. Um, it has profoundly altered how the price of electricity has been set in the state of California. And that matters. This is just a graph of the daily power price in the day ahead market for the month of March of 2017. And if we just zoom in on the 12th of March, you'll notice that in the middle of the day, typically a period of highest price uh, in, a, in a kind of traditional power market context, the price of uh, electricity was actually negative. 
in, in California. And that's because there was a lot of sun uh, on that day, and gas-fired power stations were paying to stay on so that later in the day when the sun goes away, they would be available for the ramp. And uh, this is a problem uh, because uh, if into the future we want our power markets to elicit capacity and investment, we cannot expect to have the producers or the investors paying to provide the product. The other, and I mean, it's a very, very serious issue. Uh, the other issue is that our system and gas units in particular are being dispatched in a much more aggressively dynamic sense. So this is just some uh, data from California. I don't want to go into the detail here, but we're really ramping these power plants much more aggressively now, and that really points to the fact that into the future, a retooled system will require much greater flexibility. We require flexibility through things like transmission capacity, certainly, flexible, more flexible, dispatchable generation, and then things like storage and active demand management, the digitization of the system. Today, I'm sure you're all hearing a lot about batteries. Uh, they are part of the story, certainly, and they provide a lot of flexibility. Having a battery means the power system now has a much bigger toolbox. Um, but the integration of batteries is going to be complicated, not just because of the technical issues with respect to batteries and, indeed, their cost, but also the legal frameworks within which batteries will have to fall on the power system. So that's a very important issue that we're going to have to contend with. I would point to the fact that, in addition, it's not just about pure technical solutions. In California, at the moment, they're actually experimenting with a modified version of their real-time power market known as the energy imbalance market, which is basically allowing California to draw on and supply resources to the broader Western interconnection. Um, and that makes sense. It's exploiting the geographical variation in the region more broadly, and that's helping to reduce the amount of curtailment of, uh, of solar. It's helping to reduce the amount of cost, ultimately, to the customer. And critically, it's actually helping to reduce the amount of carbon required in delivering electricity service to everyone. So I'm going to conclude there and, and, and turn it over to the nuclear point because I think it's very, very important indeed, and maybe we'll have a few minutes for conversation. Thank you very much.